Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 30, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 68. One day last month an awkward-looking machine in deep space listened patiently for radio signals from Earth. The machine had left the Earth some four years earlier, and it will never return. But the machine, a space robot, felt no loneliness. It was doing the job it had been built to do. After plunging along through the vast reaches of deep space, it was heading for a dramatic rendezvous. Finally, the space robot detected the radio signals it had been waiting for. As the signals came crackling through space from Earth, they were very faint. They had taken nearly an hour and a half to arrive due to the astronomical distance involved. Even so, the space robot recognized the radio commands and obeyed them. It awakened, flexed its mechanical arms, and opened its television eyes, and it radioed back to Earth that it was ready for its awesome rendezvous in space. In Pasadena, California, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory announced to reporters that all was well. Voyager 2 was operating perfectly as it approached that spectacular planet of rings, Saturn. And equally important, Voyager 2 was right on course. It had been racing through space for four years and was nearly a billion miles away. That's over ten times the distance from Earth to the Sun, and yet Voyager 2 was only three seconds off schedule after its four-year journey. As the Voyager 2 space robot approached Saturn, it started speeding up. On August 25, Voyager 2 came within 63,000 miles of Saturn itself. That's only about one-fourth the distance from the Earth to the Moon. As it did so, it was traveling three times as fast as the alleged Space Shuttle in orbit. Then Voyager 2 raced outward again, passing through the mysterious rings as it went. For days as Voyager 2 approached Saturn, flew past it, and then left Saturn behind, we got to see full-color pictures of what it saw. Once again, scientists and non-scientists alike wanted to know, might there be other life out there? The royally angry atmosphere of Saturn itself appeared to say, no life here, at least no life that you and I can imagine. Then we saw pictures of the moons of Saturn. Scientists were puzzled and amazed by the surprises they saw. Each moon is different from the others, and yet as far as the question of life is concerned, it seems that they are all the same, cold, frozen worlds and fragments of worlds, worlds covered with craters like the scars of a celestial smallpox, broken worlds having one impossible giant crater on one side and covered with shatter lines everywhere else. As far as life is concerned, Saturn turned out to be another Jupiter. Even if some of the building blocks of life are present here and there, no independent life seems to have gotten started there. Up to now, man's search of the Solar System seems to have turned up the same answer everywhere concerning life. Mars looks as if it may have held life long ago, but if so, apparently something destroyed it. Venus is a rich planet in many ways, but due to its heat and other factors, the richness of Venus apparently does not include native life. As for Mercury, the innermost planet, the prospects look even more dim. Mercury is so close to the Sun that it is believed there could be rivers of lead on the sunward side. As I say these words, Voyager 2 is once again plunging through the trackless void of deep space. Next stop, Uranus, five years from now. If Voyager 2 survives that solitary journey, it may teach us still more, but we don't need to wait that long to start drawing conclusions about our own spaceship, Earth. My friends, our beautiful planet Earth is unique in our solar system. It's just the right size to hold the atmosphere we need to breathe and to retain the water we need to drink, and it's just the right distance from the Sun. Much farther away and our planet would become too cold, much closer and it would become too hot. As it is, everything we need for life is present in a God-given balance. The other planets of our Solar System are fascinating, 
spectacular, and perhaps even useful to man some day, but there is no other planet so useful, so beautiful, and so spectacular as the blue planet, Planet Earth. Today men obsessed by greed and lust for power are threatening to destroy what God created for you and me here on Earth. They are playing games of war with biological and chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, and genetic engineering. They are contaminating our world with hazardous wastes to satisfy their own selfish desires. The present-day pilots of Spaceship Earth are flying us all on a collision course with catastrophe. If they are not stopped, we have already seen our future through the robot eyes of Voyager 2. The good Earth, our God-given home, will end up as a dead and broken world. Our three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The Reagan-Bagan Axis and Expanding World Crises. Topic No. 2. Deliberate Delays in the Space Shuttle Launch. And Topic No. 3. The Reagan Budget and Corrupt Economic Plans. Topic No. 1. Earlier this month on September 10, a two-day summit meeting between the United States and Israel ended here in Washington. Afterward, the entities Reagan and Begin gushed with words of mutual praise. It was as if the recent Israeli air warfare on Iraq and Lebanon had never happened. There was not a whisper to suggest that Washington was asking Israel to show any restraint in the future. Instead, there were glowing words about a major new enlargement of the strategic relationship between the United States and Israel. Officially, this new military relationship will focus on three major areas. One area of collaboration will be the stockpiling of American war material in Israel. Supposedly this will include everything from medical supplies to tanks and other weapons for the so-called Rapid Deployment Force. The stockpiling of American weapons in Israel is being presented to the public as if it were a new development. But the fact is that this has been going on in secret for years. I first reported about this in my AUDIO LETTERS as long as six years ago in the autumn of 1975. In AUDIO LETTER 6 especially, I reported the stockpiling of American weapons, including battlefield nuclear weapons, in Israel. They were there as part of the long-range preparations for the coming limited nuclear strike by Israel against the Saudi Arabian oil fields. Today, six years later, those plans are coming closer and closer to being carried out. The second major area of American and Israeli cooperation announced this month involves joint strategic planning and sharing of intelligence. Here again the public is being told that this will be something new, while in reality it is already established practice. When Israel destroyed the Iraqi nuclear plant last June with American F-16s, it was only part of a larger joint strategy. Likewise, the Reagan Administration plan to sell AWACS radar planes to Saudi Arabia has the secret approval of Israel. It is intended to help give Israel the pretext, the excuse it needs for attacking the Saudi oil fields. I have reported in detail about these joint strategic plans by Israel and the United States in recent tapes. Likewise, I have reported in the past about other aspects of this ongoing joint military planning. My friends, there is nothing new about it at all. The Reagan-Bagan team also proclaimed the initiation of a third major area of military cooperation. We are told that the military forces of the United States and Israel will start holding joint exercises and war games. As with the rest of the package deal, we are supposed to believe that this is something new. But the fact is that far more than practice exercises have been carried out already by Israel and the United States. Not mere exercises, but actual joint military operations have taken place several times in recent years. Up to now all of these joint military operations have been covert. 
all have been totally hidden from public view except one. That one exception was Operation Guyana in November 1978. That case was unique because a headline-making event was used as a cover for the secret military operation itself. We were not allowed to hear any news reports about the secret American-Israeli commando raid into Guyana that month. Our government had never admitted that there was a Russian missile base there, and so we were not told about it when that base was destroyed, but we did see the stomach-turning event which was staged first in order to make the commando raid possible, the Jonestown Massacre. A few days ago, the only American trial in connection with the Guyana tragedy ended in mistrial. Larry Layton, a former member of the Jim Jones cult, had been seized upon as a scapegoat, but Leighton was no more than a bit player on the Guyana stage, and his trial ended with a hopelessly deadlocked jury. Meanwhile, the real culprits at Jonestown have gone scot-free because the real criminals, my friends, are the members of the secret Joint Military Junta of the United States and Israel. In AUDIO LETTER No. 67 last month, I called attention to this Joint Military Junta and its growing power, and now the outcome of the Reagan-Bagan meeting this month has given public confirmation of this Junta's existence. The broad strategic relationship between the United States and Israel is not new as claimed. What is new is that the Joint Bolshevik Zionist Junta is increasingly going public. As their power grows, they are flaunting that power more and more. It is just one more symptom of the Bolshevik Zionist mentality I discussed last month. Once they acquire power, these people always go too far. The Reagan-Bagan Axis is at the very center of an expanding whirlpool of world crises. World trouble spots are continuing to multiply. The Bolshevik strategy to prepare the world for war, which I revealed last spring in AUDIO LETTER No. 63, is having its effect. Slowly but surely the whole world is being sucked up into the swirling vortex of tension and conflict, and at the very center the Reagan-Bagan axis is stirring the pot faster and faster. The growing storm of world conflict right now is centered in the Middle East. In the eye of the storm sits Israel. Moving outward from Israel in any direction, there is growing turmoil. First look to the north at Lebanon. After Begin left Washington this month, the Israelis wasted no time in once again heating up their running battle with the PLO. On September 17, a scant week after the Reagan-Begin meeting, there were two large bomb explosions in northern and southern Lebanon. As usual, PLO guerrillas were supposed to be the targets, but also, as usual, those who were actually killed by the Israeli blasts were mostly civilians, including many women and children. Those two bombings killed over 40 people and injured over a hundred. Their intended purpose was to provoke retaliatory raids against Israel by the PLO so that the Israeli government can shout about their enemy being the PLO menace. But the PLO has not yet obliged the Israelis by striking back. The Israelis are in a hurry to whip up new war tensions, so there have been more Israeli bombings in Lebanon in recent days, and they will continue. The Israelis intend to goad the PLO however long it takes to provoke a counterattack. Then when that happens, the resulting Israeli casualties will be big news in Israel and America. Prime Minister Begin will be seen speaking self-righteously of the unacceptable threat that continues to come from the PLO, and he will make sure to mention Saudi Arabia as the real culprit for bankrolling the PLO. In this way, my friends, Israeli terrorism in Lebanon is actually being aimed at Saudi Arabia. Lately the Israeli government has been talking about a permanent solution to the alleged problem of PLO raids against Israel. It started two months ago 
after an alleged PLO attack killed and injured several Israelis. Begin announced that Israel was going to put a stop to these raids, quote, once and for all, unquote. A few days later the Israeli Air Force horrified the world by its all-out bombing of Beirut and all of southern Lebanon. Now the Israelis are goading the PLO into striking again, and if they do, the Israeli Government will say, in effect, that hitting guerrilla bases in Lebanon will never provide the permanent solution desired. Instead, Begin's accusing finger will point more and more at Saudi Arabia. My friends, it's all part of the build-up to the planned limited nuclear strike by Israel on the Saudi oil fields. Meanwhile, the Reagan end of the Reagan-Begin axis is hard at work on the planned AWACS radar plane sail to Saudi Arabia. That's intended to be just one more nail in Saudi Arabia's coffin by making Saudi Arabia look like a direct threat to Israel. As it stands right now, there's a chance that the AWACS sale will not be approved by Congress. This is a result of the hidden power struggle now dividing the United States Government. But even if AWACS does not go through, the Reagan-Bagan team have an ace in the hole. Britain has already promised to fill the breach if the AWACS deal falls through. If not AWACS, then the Saudis can buy a similar British plane called Nimrod, and for purposes of giving Israel a pretext for attack, Nimrod will serve very well indeed. In addition to Saudi Arabia, Syria is being drawn into the web of Israeli war plans by way of Lebanon. We Americans often forget that Syria, unlike Israel, has a legal right to be in Lebanon. The Lebanese Government invited Syria into Lebanon to put a halt to fighting between the rightists and leftists of Lebanon itself. The Syrians are there as the main body of an Arab peacekeeping force. And, my friends, the Syrians have not been asked to leave. By contrast, Israel possesses no legal right whatsoever to conduct military operations of any kind in Lebanon. But to those who rule Israel, might makes right. Lebanon is weak and Israel is strong, so the Israelis consider it their right to attack real or imagined enemies at will in Lebanon. Late last April, Israeli jets shot down two Syrian helicopters. The Syrians, who I repeat are in Lebanon legally, responded by bringing anti-aircraft missiles into that area of Lebanon. The Israelis, who had no right to be there in the first place, immediately cried foul. A crisis erupted over the Syrian SAM missiles. For over three months now the crisis over the Syrian missiles has been dormant. Israel has been busying itself in other ways. It has destroyed the Iraqi nuclear plant and carried out genocide raids against the residents of Beirut. In the meantime, the Syrian anti-aircraft missiles have not injured Israel, but now the Israelis are ready to stoke up trouble with Syria again. And so just in the past few days, the entity Begin has abruptly revived the Syrian missile issue. He is saying that they must be removed without delay. Otherwise, says Begin, Israel will not be responsible for the consequences. Can you imagine? If Syria can somehow be drawn into the vortex of Middle East war tensions, it will help bring Nuclear War I one, one step closer. Syria is a client state of Russia with the closest ties to Russia of any Arab state. The Syrian SAM missiles in Lebanon are Russian-made. Should the Begin Government engineer a military confrontation with Syria, Russia could not ignore it. And then there is Egypt. The entity known as President Sadat is being programmed now to self-destruct. In recent weeks he has suddenly shed the moderate image which had been cultivated for Western eyes. Instead, now there is Sadat's crackdown on all opposition. It is his crackdown on religious opposition 
That has made most of the headlines, but there is more involved too. For example, Special Security Police are now being planted on the University campuses of Egypt to squash any student protests against Sadat. For the moment, these tactics may appear to make Sadat's grip on his country more secure, but the longer-term effect will be the opposite. Like the late Shah of Iran, the entity Sadat will be undone by all these repressive tactics. It is only a matter of time before assassination politics puts an end to the Sadat era in Egypt. The end of Sadat, or the entity known as Sadat, will also spell the end of the Camp David Peace Accords, so-called. Other Arab leaders, including influential leaders in Egypt itself, are against the Camp David approach. The events now taking place in Egypt are setting the stage for collapse of the so-called Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty. As I detailed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 44, that was always the intention of those in the United States and Israel who brought about the treaty. As a former CIA operative revealed to me in this connection, quote, to have a war you first have to have a peace treaty, then break the treaty, and presto, war." Unquote. Already the contrived era of good feeling between Israel and Egypt is beginning to suffer. Earlier this month on September 12, Egypt canceled a scheduled visit to Egypt by Israeli military officers. The reason? Israel's Defense Minister had said in public that Sadat will not be around long. Under the terms of the Egyptian-Israeli Treaty, Israel is scheduled to complete its withdrawal from the Sinai next April 1982. In the process, two large Israeli air bases in the Sinai will also pass into Egyptian hands. That is, if the treaty provisions are carried out, the demise of Sadat or even a weakening of the present Egyptian government may provide Israel with sufficient pretext not to withdraw. At the same time, plans are also being laid again to trigger a major incident in the Sinai. This was part of the plan I first made public six years ago, and it's once again part of the plan now. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all these nearby Arab neighbors of Israel are in the front lines of the Reagan-Bagan war maneuvering, but the whirlpool expands outward from there. When Israeli battlefield atomic weapons cap off Saudi Arabia's oil fields, it will send shock waves through the industrialized world. It will cripple the industrial heart of Europe. It will provide the excuse for gas rationing here in the United States as our country secretly shifts onto a war footing, and it will increase the strategic importance of oil-rich Iran just across the Persian Gulf. Under the so-called Khomeini regime, Iran is producing far less oil than its capacity. With Saudi Arabia gone, substandard production from Iran will seem intolerable to the world. On top of that, the Reagan Administration will remind us of Iran's geographic location. Nestled along the strategic underbelly of Russia, we will be told that Iran is in danger. But to the Bolshevik military junta in America, Iran's real attraction is offensive in nature. Because of its location, Iran is an ideal base from which to attack Russia. It's no accident, my friends, that Iran is now heading down the road to civil war. For the past several months, top members of the Moslem ruling circles in Iran have been the targets of assassination, including several major bombing incidents. The process now underway in Iran is the one I warned about two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 52. In that report I detailed how the Khomeini government came to power in the first place. It was helped along by forces of which it was not even aware, Bolshevik forces. In AUDIO LETTER No. 52 I stated that, quote, they planned to martyr the entire Khomeini government as they set off thermonuclear war, unquote. And that's what's going on now, my friends. The first to be martyred was the real Ayatollah Khomeini himself in February 1980. 
I reported his death and replacement by a double in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. Now the rest of his regime is being cut down for purposes of war. Elsewhere around the world the war plans of the Bolshevik Zionist Military Junta are also moving forward. On the surface many of these other world tensions have no apparent connection with a ferment in the Middle East and Persian Gulf, but behind closed doors there are connections. What links them all together is the master plan which is to bring nuclear war out of a world in crisis. A prominent example of this is Poland. A few weeks ago the so-called Solidarity Labor Union celebrated its first anniversary in Poland. Last year I reported that Solidarity had been created by the Bolsheviks for the purpose of bringing on war. As I explained then, Solidarity's true purpose is not to serve the workers of Poland, but to use them. The whole purpose of Solidarity is to create as much trouble as possible for Russia, including, if possible, revolution. During the year that has passed, Solidarity has behaved exactly as I told you it would act. Solidarity never rests for a moment to consolidate its gains. Instead, the moment one set of demands are satisfied by the Polish Government, new and even greater demands are put forth by Solidarity. The workers who form the backbone of Solidarity's power have not been given a moment to taste the fruits of success. Instead, there have only been strikes, protests, more strikes, strife and turmoil. As a result, the vulnerable economy of Poland has been thrown into a tailspin. And now, having helped to create Poland's worsening economic problems, Solidarity's leaders are demanding greater power to control the economy. To see how extreme Solidarity has been in its behavior over the past year, just compare it with our labor unions in the West. We are used to unions that bargain, make contracts, and then abide by them for some agreed period. No union in America, for example, would even dream of demanding a new contract with greater demands every few weeks. But that, my friends, is exactly what Solidarity has been doing in Poland. In recent AUDIO LETTER reports I've mentioned that the Bolsheviks and Zionists are shooting for war to break out around mid-1982. Events in the Middle East are being pushed along on that timetable, and so are those in Poland. By next summer at the latest, the Bolsheviks are convinced that Russia will have to act against Solidarity. The resulting bloodshed will be just one more spark to help ignite NUCLEAR WAR ONE. All around the world the Bolshevik cauldron of crises is bubbling hotter and hotter. United States rhetoric against Castro's Cuba is heating up once again. El Salvador is simmering with new turmoil, and half a world away tensions are growing between Pakistan and India. The Reagan Administration is promising F-16s to Pakistan. In lightning response, Russia has already delivered super-fast MiG-25s to India, and one day, my friends, India will stun the world by inviting Russian soldiers into India. The objective of the Reagan-Bagan Axis is to stir up the whole world for war, and, my friends, they are succeeding. Topic No. 2 According to the schedule announced by NASA several months ago, today was supposed to be the launch day for America's second Space Shuttle flight, but once again the Space Shuttle has suddenly started encountering new delays. The first delay was announced several weeks ago when the shuttle was rolled out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The rollout took place on August 31, five days behind schedule. NASA spokesman said that the launch date was being moved back from September 30 to October 9. No big deal, they said, just a few minor bugs to be worked out. For the next few weeks, Occasional news reports from the Kennedy Space Center continued to assure us that all was well with the Shuttle. Then came September 22, and suddenly everything changed. 
We were told that just past midnight the previous night an accident had occurred on the launch pad. Supposedly the mishap took place while the control rockets in the nose of the Space Shuttle were being fueled up. NASA spokesman said that nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer was spilled on the outside of the shuttle, affecting several hundred of the critical thermal tiles. Those life and death tiles, my friends, are stuck to the shuttle with glue, and it was said that 60 or 70 of them fell off after the leak took place. In addition, perhaps 250 more tiles would have to be removed to check them for damage. Suddenly the October 9 launch date went out the window. As of now, NASA says that the launch will probably take place in late October or early November, but my friends, don't hold your breath waiting for that. These last-minute delays of the second Space Shuttle launch are the result of important divisions within the Space Shuttle program. If those divisions and arguments are not resolved soon, there will be still more delays. To understand what is happening right now at Cape Canaveral, it's necessary to remember what has happened up to now with the Space Shuttle. To begin with, it's essential to understand that the Space Shuttle is a military program wearing a civilian disguise. All kinds of potentially fascinating and valuable scientific space missions have been scrapped by NASA. Everything is being cut to the bone except the Space Shuttle program. Right now NASA is trying to cancel a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to intercept and study Halley's Comet in 1986, but at the same time NASA is also talking about building a fifth Space Shuttle just to have a spare on hand. The reason the Space Shuttle is so crucial is that it is America's only hope for regaining military use of space. Up until four years ago this month the United States had a secret military stranglehold on space, but in September 1977 the Soviet Union began a surprise offensive in space to change all that, and change it they did. The decisive turning point came on September 27 1977. On that day the secret American military moon base in Copernicus Crater was put out of action. That was the outcome of history's first true space battle, the Battle of the Harvest Moon. It was a battle of beam weapons, and it took place in secret, and yet it was the most decisive battle of the 20th century, because from that moment on, my friends, Russia began seizing total control of the military use of space. When those secret events took place four years ago, the Space Shuttle program froze in its tracks. The hardliners then in control of the Kremlin had slammed shut the military door to space. Soon we started hearing excuse after excuse for delays in the Space Shuttle, especially there were all those stories about problems with the thermal tiles of the Shuttle. Years passed and the Shuttle stayed grounded. Meanwhile America's military capability in space withered. In October 1977 Skylab was shot down by a Russian Cosmos interceptor. Skylab had been a vital way station in America's secretly continuing moon program. By destroying it Russia made sure that America's eviction from the moon was permanent. Meanwhile, the Russians themselves began landing on the moon without public fanfare. For nearly four years now Russian beam weapons have been stationed on the moon pointed at the earth. When the Russians shot down Skylab they did so over the United States. The result was a giant fireball breaking up into pieces. It was seen in half a dozen states from Texas to Missouri. NASA waited a week or so for headlines about the mysterious fireball to die down. Then it began a long, drawn-out cover-up of the Skylab debacle. NASA pretended that Skylab was unexpectedly sinking from orbit, and just for good measure they also pretended that the Space Shuttle might be able to save Skylab. 
It all sounded good to an unsuspecting public, but the shuttle stayed grounded, and at last NASA pretended that Skylab had crashed half a world away over the Indian Ocean. In addition to Skylab, the United States lost its space reconnaissance capabilities to Russian Cosmos interceptors. By the spring of 1978, the United States no longer had any spy or early warning satellites gathering information over Russia. From time to time since then, spy satellites have been launched by the United States. Some of these have succeeded in gathering intelligence briefly over other areas of the world, but as soon as they pass over the Soviet Union, they are always destroyed. As a result, the United States no longer has up-to-date reconnaissance data on the Soviet Union. Without reconnaissance data, my friends, all the weapons in the world are next to useless. America's military planners know well enough where Russia's cities are and where critical military installations were four years ago, but without fresh reconnaissance they have no way of knowing about new targets which might now be more important. On top of that, Russia is now deploying anti-missile defenses based on beam weapons. Without fresh reconnaissance data there would be little hope of getting American missiles through those defenses, and so over the past four years reconnaissance has become the number one strategic problem of the United States. There are plenty of other problems too because we have nothing equivalent to Russia's space triad of weapons, but without reconnaissance even the weapons we do have are of little use. The Bolshevik military planners here are determined to launch a nuclear first strike against Russia come what may. I have reported many details about that in the past and will not go into it again right now, but with that in mind they have been doing everything they can think of to solve the critical reconnaissance problem. One of their earliest and most desperate ideas was one which took place in April 1978. I reported the details in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. The American CIA, working closely with its counterpart, the Korean CIA, arranged for a civilian airliner to be used for intelligence gathering. That was the case of Korean Airlines Flight 902. You may recall it took off from Europe for the United States but flew into northern Russia instead. It was secretly equipped with special photographic and electronic intelligence gear and flew into some of the most sensitive airspace in all of Russia. In effect, the unsuspecting passengers were used as hostages to discourage the Russians from shooting it down right away. Eventually Russian fighters did bring it down, but only after considerable intelligence had been obtained and transmitted. The Korean airliner ploy was successful as a stop-gap trick, but reconnaissance data can hardly be obtained that way as a routine practice. And so for the past three years we've been hearing more and more about reconnaissance aircraft. Supposedly these were made almost obsolete for most strategic purposes by spy satellites, but now they are once again in the news because we don't have spy satellites on continuous duty anymore. One reconnaissance airplane we hear more and more about these days is the SR-71 Blackbird. The latest SR-71 incident took place on August 26 when North Korea supposedly tried to shoot one down. And then there is that famous predecessor of the SR-71, the U-2. It was a U-2 that was flown by the late Francis Gary Powers when he was shot down over Russia 21 years ago. You might think that the U-2 was ready for the history books in this age of alleged spy satellites, but no. Now the U-2 is back, all dressed up and modernized with the new designation TR-1, and its job now as always is reconnaissance. If we still had all those reconnaissance satellites in the sky, reconnaissance aircraft would be less important. Naturally the Bolsheviks here try not to let you suspect the truth 
about our missing satellites, but every now and then there are hints about the truth in the news. For example, only yesterday the Defense Department released a new 99-page propaganda booklet titled Soviet Military Power. It purports to give the public previously top-secret information about the military buildup in Russia, and yet the booklet contains only sketches, no satellite photos. Why? Because the Defense Department does not have any up-to-date satellite photos of Russia. Our spy satellites are long gone. Up to now the secret Bolshevik military planners here have been making do with inferior methods of reconnaissance, but before they set off NUCLEAR WAR 1 they want better reconnaissance data on Russia. They have only one tool that offers any hope of doing the job, and that is the Space Shuttle. We've been told by NASA that there are to be four initial test flights of the Space Shuttle Columbia. After those are completed, perhaps as early as September 1982, the Shuttle will be declared operational. But the fact is, my friends, that these first four flights are being used for secret military purposes. The stakes are so high that the secret military shuttle planning team is prepared to lose a shuttle on each flight if need be. Before the Columbia lifted off from Cape Canaveral last April, three more identical orbiters were already in existence. They are hidden away in a remote hangar at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The primary goal of the secret military shuttle flights is the one I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 62. They are trying to use the Space Shuttle to orbit a sophisticated new spy satellite to fly over Russia. It's an armored laser-firing satellite designed to survive attacks by Russian space weapons long enough to radio back reconnaissance data. After that, the Bolsheviks here will be ready to set off the American nuclear first strike against Russia. In order to carry out reconnaissance over Russia, a spy satellite has to fly far to the north. That kind of orbit is far different from that which is publicly claimed for the Space Shuttle. As a result, a shuttle returning to Earth after deploying a spy satellite is unable to land at the advertised time and place. Instead, the shuttle we see taking off from Florida is scheduled to land out of our sight at a secret location in Western Australia, that is, if it survives the flight. Meanwhile, a different shuttle, the Training Shuttle Enterprise, is shown on TV landing right on schedule at Edwards Air Force Base. When the Columbia blasted off from Florida last April, it was attacked and destroyed by Russian space weapons, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 64. But the Training Shuttle Enterprise, relabeled Columbia, thrilled the public by racing in from the sea and landing in California. The covered exit vehicle was wheeled up, and it was made to appear that astronauts Young and Crippen walked out. The public perception was maintained that the mission had been a success, but it was actually a catastrophe even worse than the Bolsheviks here had thought possible. The military shuttle planners were thrown into disarray over what to do next. In AUDIO LETTER No. 65 three months ago, I described their disagreements and what they finally decided to do. After delaying for a week or so, they sent the Training Shuttle Enterprise to Florida in order to buy some time. It is the Enterprise, a training shuttle not intended for orbital flight that is now on the pad at the Kennedy Space Center. When the secret military shuttle team sent the Enterprise to Florida, they were planning to use it in an intentionally aborted launch. That is, their plan has been to launch the Enterprise then let one of its engines shut down early. That would lead to a return of the Enterprise to Cape Canaveral only minutes after its takeoff. By staging this show, the shuttle planners were expecting to keep the program alive in the public eye. Meanwhile, they would use the time to make modifications to the next shuttle mission plan to give it a better chance of success. As it stands now, the Shuttle Enterprise is still programmed 
for an artificial abort shortly after takeoff, but the arguments among the shuttle planners which I reported last June have multiplied during the summer. Several members of the group are getting very cold feet over the deliberate abort plan. They're saying, suppose something we don't plan causes real damage to the Enterprise. Suppose Ivan decides to blow it out of the sky even though it is still in camera range. We have to have the Enterprise for the Public Return segment after each mission. What if we lose it? Other shuttle planners are expressing a completely different worry. The second group is not worried about the Russians shooting down the Enterprise because it will pose no threat to Russia. What they are worried about is the public relations impact of an aborted takeoff. It has even been suggested that a full orbital launch of the Enterprise ought to be considered. The Enterprise could not do anything once it got into orbit because the cargo bay is occupied by special fuel tanks, but the viewing public would never know that thanks to the simulation films which could be broadcast. And as for re-entry, the Enterprise is covered with the same system of thermal tiles as the standard shuttles. The first group say that that plan is not good because those tiles still have never been proven in full-fledged re-entry from orbit. The Columbia was supposed to do that last April, but it never got that far. The Enterprise might get past the Russians only to disintegrate on re-entry, and that, say the Warriors, would be impossible to hide. It would stop the program. Out of all those arguments and others like them, only one consensus has emerged. The only purpose of sending the Enterprise to Florida was to buy time. Meanwhile, one of the three secret shuttles at White Sands is now being modified for the next mission. All NASA cares about doing now is to continue to buy time with the Enterprise for a while longer. Then somehow it will have to be returned to White Sands and the new shuttle will have to be brought to the Cape. And so for the moment at least the Enterprise is being used to buy time through launch delays instead of an aborted launch. For three years stories about the thermal tiles of the shuttle were used as an excuse for the prolonged grounding of the Columbia. Now NASA is trying once again to buy time, and once again an alleged problem with the thermal tiles is being used to explain away delay. We're told that there was a rocket fuel leak in the dead of night and some of the tiles came off. Only when NASA is sure what to do next will the latest tile fiasco quietly go away. Topic No. 3 Two days ago the week began with bad news from the stock exchanges of the world. Investors abroad were convinced that stocks on Wall Street were about to take a plunge, and they were trying to get out ahead of that. When the markets opened later in New York, at first they did drop fast. But the stock market manipulators here are not quite ready yet for a full-fledged stock market crash, so the New York markets abruptly turned around and headed up. By the end of the trading day the manipulators had driven the market up to an overall gain for the day. A worldwide stock market panic was postponed on Monday. Even so, the experience has given public proof of the instability of the stock market today. Two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 51 I gave a detailed warning of the parallels between the stock market today and that of 1929. The stock market has been crashing downward in slow motion in terms of real value for years now, and soon the stock market roller coaster will jump the tracks and down it will go. One of the strong similarities between today and 1929 is the role being played by the private Federal Reserve Corporation. Now as then, the Federal Reserve is deliberately ruining the economy through contraction of money and credit. The excuse given is the alleged fight against inflation. We're told that interest rates have to be high because inflation is high, but there is a glaring discrepancy in that explanation for current Federal Reserve policies. According to official government figures, the inflation rate is now around 10 percent. 
Based on all past experience, that would mean interest rates should also be around 10 percent, about equal to inflation, but instead the Fed has pushed interest rates up to a 20 percent range, double the official inflation rate. The fact is, my friends, that government figures on real inflation are lies, and so are the Federal Reserve's excuses for legalized usury. Last month I described the real purpose of current Federal Reserve policies. Business here is being deliberately weakened and made ripe for takeover. The only businesses which are not being hurt are those of the Rockefeller Cartel, which are interlocked with the Federal Reserve Corporation. The corporate fascists here are waging economic war to gain power against the state Bolsheviks in the government, so don't look for any relief. Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker testified before Congress late last month that astronomical interest rates will continue for years. Most small businesses cannot possibly earn the 20 percent profit and more that is required to pay such exorbitant interest and so they will simply die. Meanwhile, Rockefeller Cartel agents within the divided United States Government are pressing ahead fast with another facet of their plan. Last month I gave an alert to watch for an alleged new gold standard to be proposed soon by the so-called Reagan Administration. Sure enough, within the past few weeks talk of a gold standard has started mushrooming all around us. Suddenly letters to the Editor are being published on this topic which would have been ignored a few years ago. Even the entity Vice President Bush is talking about returning to a gold standard, and Business Week has just published a cover story in its September 21 edition entitled, quote, A Return to the Gold Standard, Why Reagan Might Try It, How It Would Be Done, How It Might Work, unquote. So far the bogus gold standard plan is right on track. As I detailed last month, it would not be a real gold standard at all. It's only a gimmick to influence public perceptions about the dollar and to silence new questions about our missing gold. It's being designed to look good, but it's just another corrupt and cruel trick. My friends, corruption has become the only way our leaders know. The long-suffering American people always give the benefit of the doubt to every new President, and it's always in vain. The same is true of Congress today. The more they legislate, the more the country goes to the dogs. But while they are in office we try to tell ourselves that surely they must be doing some things in our interest. Years later, after it is too late of course, sometimes we learn a little bit of the truth. A book comes out documenting the large number of bribes taken by a former President or a former Congressman is indicted for income tax evasion, but we always tell ourselves, surely it is different this time. We want to believe in our leaders, and so we rationalize away the lies, the double dealing, and the corruption we see for as long as possible. Our leaders know this is how we think and they use it against us. The entity President Reagan says we must put our economic house in order. Based on that excuse, domestic programs of all kinds are being cut down with a meat axe regardless of merit. Spending on warfare leaves nothing for welfare, and yet most foreign aid is going on untouched. The only exception to that is aid to truly needy countries of the Third World. They have no usefulness to the urgent plans for nuclear war, and so they are finding themselves out in the cold. But foreign aid to help prepare for war goes right on without let-up. Most sacrosanct of all foreign aid programs are the annual billions in aid to Israel. Over the past 33 years the United States has given over $100 billion in aid to Israel. Those very same dollars, our tax money, come right back to Capitol Hill and American multinational corporations. American tax dollars flow like water through Israeli hands into Congressional wallets, giving the Israeli lobby its clout. American foreign aid dollars to Israel are also used to buy American-made weapons of war. Those weapons will one day drag you and me 
into America's final war, Nuclear War I. If our leaders were serious about straightening out our economy, there are many things they could do. To begin with, they should start telling the truth for a change instead of heaping lies on more lies. Instead of a falsified gold standard, the scandal over our missing gold should be exposed. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 60, this could be done in connection with an international economic conference in a way that would save the world's economy. The Administration's Meat Axe approach to domestic programs should also be scrapped. Yes, my friends, many domestic programs are controversial. Some of them deserve to be. But let's put first things first. Before we take a meat axe to domestic aid, why don't we start with foreign aid, alias Congressional aid? At least the dollars spent in domestic programs keep circulating within our own economy, but those squandered on foreign aid do our economy as a whole no good. And as for Congress, if a meat axe should be wielded anywhere, that is where. More and more we're hearing about employees of all kinds of companies accepting wage cuts to help save their companies. Meanwhile, our Spendthrift Congress has just voted itself the right to line its pockets even more than in the past. I say Chop all Federal salaries in half, starting with Congress. We cannot afford to let them fiddle anymore while our economy burns. It's time, my friends, to hold their feet to the fire. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've tried to sound a warning that time is growing short economically, politically, and militarily. Men of ill will and corrupt minds are piloting our world on a collision course with disaster. As Americans await the next Space Shuttle launch, a greater countdown is underway for Spaceship Earth. One day in January 1986, the Voyager 2 spacecraft is scheduled to be approaching the giant mystery planet Uranus. Voyager will be preparing to send a bonanza of pictures and scientific data to Earth. But by then, will anyone be listening to Voyager here on Earth? The answer can be yes, my friends, if the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ becomes the guiding light for our troubled world. We must learn to build instead of destroy. We must learn peace instead of war through universal neutrality and noble competition instead of conquest and intrigue. If we do not learn these things, there may be only silence on Earth by that winter of 1986. Nine years after its launch from the blue pearl of planet Earth, Voyager 2 could be radioing signals to a deaf, gray tomb of a world. That will leave Voyager itself carrying the final sounds of Earth on a platinum record as it drifts alone forever outward to the stars. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.